All right, class. Um, thanks for being here. I hope everybody's doing well, and we'll check in more maybe at the end of class. But uh, uh, I'm, I think we have a really special treat today. Uh, it's my friend, uh, data, data storyteller extraordinaire, RJ Andrews, uh, who I was lucky to meet at a at a air at an airport via Twitter to go on a drive to a conference outside of Denver. Um, the same day I got the job interview job offer to come to San Francisco State where he already had moved to. So um, I'm really grateful for that first hours long conversation and and just overwhelmed with uh, such a curious thinker. Um, just about all kinds of ideas and how the world works. And he's made this, besides his website and all the projects that I hope you've checked out, he's made this amazing book, which I would show you copies of, but um, we don't see each other in person, um, which is just extremely valuable for thinking about this stuff. And just, it's a, it's a testament to human curiosity, I think. So um, RJ's done a lot of different things that I'll let him tell you about, but um, I'm just really grateful for him to be here and this is being recorded so if you missed it or want to listen to it again you can so rj without any more i'll say thank you so much and uh in, in the midst of everything thanks for joining us oh and he's gonna hear a screen share right away so we've got rj is taking over okay can uh, uh so because i'm screen sharing nick um i'm not going to be able to see uh, comments, I don't think. Right. So if, if there's a reason to interject or slow me down or anything else, like feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I think we're ready to go. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think go for it. Okay. I'll, I'll shout out or if somebody unmute, if there's something you need him to, you need a pause or something on. Otherwise, we'll just let you fly for a while. Nice. Okay. So um, a couple of years ago, I was at this event and I, and I, and I heard uh, not even said directly to me, I heard a side conversation and somebody said, Gothic cathedrals point toward Jerusalem. And I heard this and this, this comment like really uh, captured my attention because, well, 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 first, what does that mean for Gothic cathedrals to point toward Jerusalem? So first we understand, have to understand uh, cathedrals a little bit. And so a cathedral is, is a real physical you know, structure um, you know, with a sort of local context, the buildings around it, but it also has a wider geographic context, meaning that locally, uh, a cathedral will point its worshipers toward its altar. But, but, but the altar, if you, if you took that, that, that orange line and kept extending it, it would, it would go somewhere, right? And, and the idea behind the statement was that every Gothic cathedral, every big church in Europe pointed its worshipers not only towards the local altar, but pointed it towards the holy city in, in Jerusalem. And I, I honestly thought this was insane, but it was so insane. It was, and it was uttered at a conference that was, you know, so prestigious. I was like, well, this is worth looking into. So how do you look into it? Well, the first thing you have to do is get some data. So I started looking at cathedrals and particularly I looked at Gothic cathedrals in France. Um, I limited to France because, well, you, you sometimes have to limit your efforts to, to some bound set to make it reasonable. And I started looking at things like, when was the cathedral first constructed? You know, because when the, when the cornerstone is laid, that is the date that the orientation is set. I'm looking at things like their, their architecture and their plans. And I, I put together a data set of several dozen French cathedrals and put them right on a map. And it looks something a little like this. So here are all the cathedrals. And then what do we do? We go one by one to each cathedral and we take a measurement. So here's Notre Dame de Paris and in Paris, that we learned that the cathedral faces uh, 25 degrees south of east. And we, when we go from cathedral to cathedral, recording the orientation of each. And we're able to scatter those on a plot. And so here on the scatter plot we have on the x-axis, we have a timeline. And the timeline shows the date that the orientation of the cathedral was set when, when its construction began. And then on the vertical axis, we have that orientation. And what's really interesting about this scatter plot is that we can see that most cathedrals, um, you know, point, they, they point eastward somehow, right? None of these cathedrals are pointing west of north uh, or west, um, west of north or west of south. They're all pointing east of north, 
east of south, many are pointing due east. And so this is the first plot that you make where you say, you know, maybe there's something to this idea. But also looking across this scatter plot, you don't really see any pattern across time. It seems like it's a big mess. So the next thing we do is we throw out the timeline and we just collapse everything into a histogram. So now we're only looking at one dimension of data. We're looking at that orientation. Um, how many degrees north of east or how many degrees uh, south of east. And we notice that there's some sort of distribution here, right? It looks like there's some kind of pattern, perhaps. And so this is really interesting. And before we go any further, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to point toward Jerusalem? Because France is actually a geographic area that's large enough that depending on where you are in France, the, the orientation angle, the bearing toward Jerusalem changes. Okay, so we take the round globe and we flatten it on a map and we get these curves. So these straight bearing lines actually look like curves. All right, we combine everything we've learned so far and we get something like this. So here we have those yellow arrows pointing toward Jerusalem and then each cathedral is indicated by an orange arrow, small orange arrow that points uh, to where, uh, where it's oriented. And, and I think it's, it's really obvious, looking at this visual, that uh, Gothic cathedrals do not point toward Jerusalem. You know, there's just too many arrows that, that point somewhere else. Um, and, 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 and what's interesting is that we can see that with our eye. We don't need numbers. There's no numbers on this chart. We can see that just using, um, just using our eye and our ability to compare images. All right. So Gothic, Gothic cathedrals don't point towards Jerusalem, but all these arrows are pointing rightward. And that's really interesting. Like there has to be something going on here. And so we return to our cathedral orientation histogram that we originally found so interesting. And um, we add one more piece of data, and that is the position that the sun rises on the horizon. Because we don't think about this every day, but the sun actually moves from solstice to solstice across the year. The sun rises at a different point on the horizon. And if we look at all the sunrise positions across France, we can see that almost all of the cathedral orientations fit within that sunrise band. And I saw this, I made this chart, and I was, I was just really astounded, especially when I looked into these three outliers. So we have these three outliers, two cathedrals on the top, Metz and Chartres, and then one on the bottom, Le Mans. And I learned that these three cathedrals were actually built on the, on the foundations of earlier churches. So as we entered the Middle Ages, it became fashionable to point cathedrals towards sunrise. But before, before the Middle Ages, that wasn't the fashion at all. Okay, so we've learned something here. We've learned that cathedrals don't point towards Jerusalem. Cathedrals point their worshipers towards sunrise. And it's not just any generic sunrise. They point their worshipers towards sunrise on a particular day that is important to that cathedral, such as a, a saint's feast day. Does this all make sense, Nick? You're muted. It does to me. Okay. Um, I love it. I love it. Um, I didn't, I, I read it and I still didn't know where you're going until you got there and it's fantastic. Okay. So, um, you know, hopefully I, I went through that a little bit quickly, but hopefully that this chart is, you know, meaningful to you. You can see that it's interesting that these churches point in a, in a particular direction. Um, but the thing is that if I started with this chart and I didn't show you all the little cartoons along the way, you, you probably, well, you may not, um, you may not understand it. You, you may not appreciate it. You may not find it particularly meaningful, at least not as meaningful as you do now because I walked you through the story. Um, you certainly, if you saw this in the newspaper or on social media, I don't think it would attract your attention and engage you, right? And so really what I just walked you through is an example of visual thinking. Using data visualization, maps, charts, diagrams, information graphics um, to understand to explore a hypothesis, um, understand a question. And really, this is just the first part of the problem. Like what we've done so far 
is what's on the left side of this diagram. We've, we've, we've taken a question and we've, we've expanded, we've created all of these um, different types of uh, visual content to help us understand the question. But at a certain point, we have to collect all of that. And the second part of the process, which, which we're going to look at a little bit later in this presentation, is how do you take all that understanding, all that content, and then focus it to your viewer's attention, to your viewer's eye? How do you focus it to your audience? You know, said another way is so far, you know, we've used ma uh, a pure map, we've used a chart, we've used a diagram, we've used blends of these. We've used a diagrammatic map and we've used um, a blend between a map and a chart. And yes, a blend between a diagram and a chart. And the, really the question is, as we're trying to go from understanding the story to telling the story is what new form fits in the middle. And that new form is going to be crafted particularly for the data, for the story, and it's going to try to learn something from all of these different input pieces of content. So as Nick introduced, my name is RJ Andrews. Um, this cathedral story is, uh, is an example story from my book, Info We Trust. I introduced myself as a data storyteller. Um, and really, um, I, I, I use data uh, not just to tell stories, but to try to inform the stories that my audience tells themselves about how the world works. I'm trying to help people um, acquire better models of understanding. And so I've, I've looked at all kinds of really fun topics um, in my public work. So for example, this is a, a, a piece of a short film on endangered species. And the idea is that there's many different species of gazelle and they all have different threatened species status. And so you can see all the different species at once by their silhouettes, um, but then you can organize those silhouettes in space and encode them with different meaning. So here we have uh, the most threatened at top, the least threatened on the bottom, and then we have their orientation, whether the animal is facing left or right, indicate the population. Is the population stable or is the population, the total number of animals uh, decreasing? I also make, uh, I make, I make information graphics in all kinds of different forms. So I make interactives, I make short films, I make animations, um, I write books, I, I've, uh, I, I make prints, posters, all that kind of stuff. It's important to engage in a lot of different types of content because you learn something new about how to inform people with data from engaging across all different forms. And so this is a looping animation that shows uh, 212 flowers that bloom at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello estate. And what happens is you have a cyclical plot with the whole year stretched around a circle. And when the, the flower starts blooming, it appears on the plot. And when it stops blooming, it disappears. And so you can see that some flowers um, last for only a week. Some flowers last for several weeks. At some point in the year, many flowers are blooming. At other points in the year, very few flowers are blooming. You know, the, the big thing that, um, one of the big things that I'm really concerned with when I'm when I'm uh, discussing, uh, when I'm trying to create a data story is creating meaningful comparisons. And so this is a frame from a short film about the national parks I made, and it compares Yosemite National Park to Zion National Park. And this is, uh, this is using a, a geographic uh, or cartographic technique called a transverse profile. And it's, and, and honestly, that doesn't, it doesn't really matter what like the technical vocabulary is like how it's made or what it means. What, what, what matters is I'm presenting a comparison that I think everybody can access, even though the technology behind it, you know, might be a little, might be a little complicated and might be, might be tough to make the thing. Um, the, the presentation of the thing is something that's widely accessible to all. So what can you see here? You can see that the Yosemite Valley is, wider and deeper than the Zion Valley, but that they both exist at, um, at a similar sea level. And you know, one of the questions is, well, where do you get your ideas? Well, I was hiking in Yosemite soon after moving to California, and I, I, I had no real grasp on the scale of the valley because it was so big. It was just very hard for me to wrap my head around, how, what is this thing? But I was already very familiar with Zion. And so I was very curious that I knew Yosemite was bigger than Zion, um, just from a rough feel, but I had no real way of, of, of seeing exactly how it was bigger. And so th this image is something that uh, resulted from that point of inspiration. So that's, that's a little bit of a background on me as a data storyteller, some of the things I'm interested in and some of the types of projects that I've, that I've produced. Um, 
you know, we have, we have a, a, a little bit less than an hour um, left with one another. And I thought that maybe I'd, I'd tell you a little bit about how I think about some of these things. Um, maybe we can look at a couple more projects in depth. And then, uh, and then finally, I think it'd be interesting to look at some of the COVID-19 data visualization um, that, that's out there right now, because uh, really we, we, are, uh, we are experiencing uh, a decade or more of, of, of a golden age in data visualization. And this COVID-19 story, um, as, as much of a horror show it is, it, 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 it is, it is a brilliant example of how data visualization can um, inform us and can motivate us to action and can really capture, capture our attention. Okay, so um, data is a scary word. Um, you know, it, a, a lot of people um, sort of shut down when they hear the word data. Uh, it, it, it's sort of a big turnoff. But really all data is, is a history. All it is, is just somebody in the past decided to write something down and in a way that it gets thrown forward into the future. And, you know, data, you, you can't capture everything, but so you have to be choosy about what you capture and what you decide to, to throw forward. So it's just a history and history has two eyes, right? So, um, and what's the first eye? Well, the first eye is cartography or maybe geography. That is the, the, the eye of space. And so when you're looking around, um, you know, where you're living and, and sort of understanding how one room connects to another or how where you live connects to your, your local um, city or town, you know, you're thinking in very spatial terms. And so, you know, before there's data visualization, we had maps. And maps um, are just wonderfully attractive uh, ways of understanding the world. Um, and so that's sort of the first eye of history is space, cartography, uh, the, the making of maps or geography, the study of maps. But history has a second eye and the second eye is time. And what time does is it allows us, it allows us to take some of the tools of uh, cartography, the making of maps, and port them over like the blue grid and use those same tools to understand things that we can't see with our own eyes. So here's the increase in San Francisco Bay Area population over time. And you can see we have a timeline on the bottom. We have um, uh, amount of population on the vertical axis and you can see an increase in population. And there's, there's no way you could actually see this with your real eyes. You know, you can't go outside and take a helicopter ride around San Francisco and see the, the, the population increasing. Even if you could see all the people at once, you wouldn't be able to actually watch them over time all at once. Like it's a completely invisible thing that's happening that we um, are able to bring out of the realm of invisibilia and bring it into the realm where you can see it, where you can plot it, where you can see it in the terms of space, which we really, really love and understand something that was invisible about the world and make it visible. And what's really wonderful about that is not only can you see it, but it's outside of your head. It's something that goes on, on the screen or on the table and you and um, a colleague, a partner, a friend, a classmate can all point to it and have a conversation about it. And so um, being able to externalize what is invisible to the visible world is very, very powerful. So this duality, the two eyes of history is a very, very old idea. Um, the first modern timeline you know, goes all the way back to the 1750s and its maker Jacques Barbeau du Borg you know, said, said in an essay when he published the first modern timeline, can't duration be imitated and represented as significantly as distinctly as space and can't intervals also be counted by degrees. So this is something that, um, that we've been obsessed with, with, with hundreds of years, trying to understand invisible di dimensions and bring them to the visible world as well as we can see space. Um, and when we, think about, when we think about that cathedral story, uh, what's so interesting about the cathedral story is that you can only really see the pattern when you see all the cathedrals at once. You can only understand what's happening when you look at dozens of cathedrals at once. Um, otherwise, um, you know, you could visit a single cathedral. You could go to Paris and stand in front of Notre Dame and 
even though you're right there and you're having an incredibly real, salient, authentic experience, you would never understand how the cathedral is manipulating you and forcing you to face the sunrise on a particular day. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Great. So I'm going to switch to a browser now and show you a couple of interactives that I've published recently. And then I think we'll, we'll, um, we'll go over to COVID-19 viz. So this is something I created for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, landing. And um, this idea of space and time is exactly what I was after when I created this chart or when I created this story. Um, because the Apollo 11 landing was the anniversary was, was approaching and I realized I didn't really understand it. I knew that there was this one small step for man. I knew that um, they sort of bounced around a little and saluted a flag and I knew that they returned safely. And that was like kind of it. Like I didn't understand how long were they on the moon? How many moonwalks were there? How long did they spend up there? What did they really do? What did they accomplish? Like all these like basic kind of like human, like, like, like questions were just like, just were not there. And, and, and it turns out, well, like they, they explored an area the size of a baseball diamond. They only spent like two hours out on the moon surface. They had a slumber party after spending those two hours because they had to rest after an incredibly um, stressful uh, journey to get to the moon surface. So I, I didn't know that they slept for, or at least tried to sleep because it was very difficult for them to actually get good sleep on the moon surface. It wasn't until, um, um, it wasn't until a couple of Apollo missions later that they figure out the right mix of sleeping pills to, to give uh, the astronauts actual rest on the moon's on the lunar surface. So this is called Neil and Buzz go for a walk. I'm going to scroll through it. Um, and hopefully everything loads. Okay. Um, sometimes with zoom, um, it doesn't, but what I'm doing is using, you know, the modern convention of a chat window and I'm pulling out the most salient parts of, of the lunar transcript. And we have Neil Armstrong in red, Buzz Aldrin in blue, and they're chatting back and forth. And then we have all this context in, in gray. And then what you're going to see is as, as I scroll through, is that Neil and Buzz eventually are going to pop out and start to move around the lunar surface. And if we hover over any of these, um, over any of these graphics, you can see the actual Apollo content, uh, the actual Apollo media. Um, okay, so the point of this is not to read the transcript to you. You can go and experience this yourself, but to just give you an idea of my attempts at making something that conveys both space and time. So you have these little ghost trails of the astronauts moving around the surface. And then on the bottom, I'm showing you the timeline. And on the timeline, each bubble is, is an exchange in the transcript. And I'm showing you which ones in these colors I'm actually highlighting and showing you how much I'm not highlighting. And then the timeline sort of ask, a, acts as some kind of progress bar from beginning to end. And you can see how, how, uh, how far along we're coming. There's Michael Collins going across the screen as he's, as he's orbiting the moon. And, and so there, again, the, the goal isn't to read, read the transcript to you, but show you just sort of an attempt by me to wrangle this, uh, this, this, this duality of history, space and time. How do we understand space and time at the same time? Okay, so this is, um, this is uh, Neil and Buzz go for a walk. Um, you know, they went, they went for a walk and um, you know, how, 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 how fantastic was that? You know, especially at times like this, when we might be feeling a little bit down about, you know, uh, the accomplishments of humanity. Um, you know, I think it's really important to uh, remember the times that, that we really soared. Um, okay, so that's Neil and Buzz go for a walk. You've seen Bloom. Um, I'll show one more interactive before going to COVID because I want to make sure that we have a lot of time to, to, to um, you know, a answer questions, uh, you know, related to COVID-19. Um, so this is something um, that I made and it's an interactive timeline of the history of information graphics. So I know that you're studying information graphics and data visualization. And one of the things that's, that's um, that I, I think underappreciated is that this is a field with a 400 year history. Um, it's very, very old. And it's, it's, it's helped us in many, many ways across many, many dimensions of society. It's helped us get a lot better at, um, 
at civilization. And so this interactive, what it allows you to do is play with all these little uh, cartoon representations. And so we've already seen um, uh, Barbeau Duborg's timeline. And so here it is on the interactive. And then you can use um, the buttons or the arrows on your keyboard to actually scroll through and see all these, um, all these really important milestones in the history of information graphics. Okay, so that's something that maybe you know you want to go and play with and um, and explore a little bit. I think that I'll highlight um, you know one of one of one of my favorites, which is um, which is uh, Florence Nightingale's um, wedges or uh, uh, Nightingale rose diagram, um, just because we are quickly approaching the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's. Uh, birth on May 10th, 2020 will be her 200th birthday. And, um, and there's an ongoing celebration of her work and of her in, uh, work in information graphics. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and go back to the presentation. Um, Just so you know, I, they, some of them, we shared a link to your article on her. Um, so some of them may already have read it. And if they haven't, it's posted on our site. Great. So I'll show you one more project before COVID stuff. Um, so this is, this is the most recent um, big public project I've done. It's called Cross Sections Through California. And so uh, I live just across town um, in the dog patch neighborhood of San Francisco. And you know California has, has made a big impact on my life since moving here a few years ago. And so I made this map and there it is. So this is, uh, this is a low quality GIF of my wife um, folding and unfolding it. And so this is, this, is a, uh, this is a map that is meant to be held and seen in real life. It's made for print first, not for screens. But since we only have screens, I'll show you a little bit. This is me introducing the map at the David Rumsey Map Center at Stanford, which is, uh, which is the temple to cartography and it's open every day from one to five. So as soon as, you know, if you, if you love information graphics and maps, this is, this is like one of the best places to go and hang out and explore. They have these giant video walls. So, you know, uh, hop on, hop on Caltrain, go down to Stanford. And um, this is like one of just like the coolest places, I think in, in, in not only the Bay Area, but the whole world to, to experience and see. Um, and so I was able to introduce the map at, the David Rumsey's uh, map center. And so what is the map? So it's this long map and I'm gonna show it to you kind of piece by piece. And what it is is it's showing those transverse profiles just like we saw earlier with the national parks where we compared Yosemite to Zion. And what, you're, what you get a sense of is both um, the elevation profile across the whole state of California, but also what's happening. And so at the very top of California, um, we have a lot of mountains and peaks. You can see Mount Shasta right in the middle of the screen. Um, and then as you go down, and we'll go down a little bit, you can see that things become um, a little bit drier. You have the, the start of the Great Central Valley. You can see some cities. And eventually, we get into the desert the, uh, south of the state where it's very, very dry. Um, okay, so that's, that's, the, that's like the big idea of the map. You know, I mentioned earlier that I, I, I try to make things that um, that, that everybody can access. Ideally, you, you want to publish things that even will engage a child and something that a child um, will, will be attracted to and, and will get some meaning out of. Um, you know, that's sort of like one of the metrics or, or one of the lenses we use to, to view work. But that doesn't mean that the ability to do, to do the work is childlike. And so what's behind this chart? Well, there's, there's multi-resolution land characteristics, consortium land cover data, where I'm pulling all these icons from, you know, and then I'm actually uh, getting USGS um, uh, profiles um, to, to make all the elevation profiles. And what's the inspiration for this map? Okay, so this is a 1945 Isotype Institute uh, cross-sectional profile map of the Soviet Union. And so this is the direct inspiration. So by creating this map of California, what I'm doing is reviving a, uh, uh, reviving a particular style. Um, and, and so here it is all in one shot. And one of the things that's really interesting, and I, I think it would have been difficult to notice because you're only seeing a, a, a small piece of the map at a time, but this map, north doesn't go up. And the reason north doesn't go up is because that's a horrible use of the rectangular page. Um, 
this map is rotated and you can see the north arrow on the left side of your screen. Uh, north is actually angled away from up and that helps me make California as big as possible and fit it on the screen. It also helps it also helps by making Cal, like positioning California the way we think about California. You know, we think of Los Angeles as like below us, right? It's not below us. Like the ocean is below us. Los Angeles is not below us. Um, but it's, it's actually, you know, much eastward of us. But that's not really how we think about California. We think of the coast as going up and down. And in, in the same way, we think of the ocean as going out right? The ocean's going out. So the, not only does rotating the map help it fit, fit better on the page, but it also matches how we think, I believe, how Californians think about their state. Um, and there's some precedent uh, for doing this. If you look at old um, auto maps of California, sure enough, they do the same thing. They rotate California so that it can fit better on the, on the page. So, um, that's cross sections through California. At least this is one side of cross sections through California. Because one of the cool things with print that is unlike um, uh, the screen is that you get a back, you get an exterior. And so what I've determined to do is create, um, create little charts for the exterior of the map. And I've since, uh, I've since made them and this is what they look like. There's, uh, they're all somehow related to the land in California. One is about crops, one is about sources of electricity, and one is about population growth. And just like the, the front, the interior of the map is inspired by the Isotype Institute, each one of these um, little charts for the exterior are also inspired by original Isotype designs. And so the first one's most valuable crops. And again, you know, compared to some of the other work, this is, this is very simplistic, almost childlike. Um, but making it so simplistic and childlike is, is honestly one of the hardest design challenges there are because it, it's so, it, 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 there's really just no room for error. Everything has to be um, a, a incredibly intentional in how, in how you uh, design your icons and place them and choose what does each icon represent. And so in this case, each um, food icon represents a certain amount of, of, of market value it represents dollars. And then the uh, rectangular plot behind each one represents a certain amount of land used to produce, produce that crop. So we have crops, we have sources of electricity, and you can see that um, California, and this really surprised me, California, um, you know, uh, uh, gets its electricity from a really, really diverse um, set of sources. And not only a diverse set of sources, but it gets a lot of electricity, it imports it. And this chart doesn't tell it, but I learned that California imports its electricity not only from other states, but also from Canada, which, uh, which surprised me. And then finally, we have population growth. And so we have population growth, um, you know, separated by male and female, which is how the US Census uh, records population. And we have, um, you know, an interesting flip happen in California. Um, uh, so there's two things that you can see in this, in this population growth chart. One is the and like absolute explosion. Each one of these icons represents 100,000 Californians. And you can see from 1850 and then, uh, f uh, you know, an additional 40 years in each group, um, how many more we have. Again, similar to like that cathedral chart we looked at at the very beginning. Um, you know, there's no real numbers on this chart. You know, the idea is to sort of convey some sort of, um, to, to, to convey an image and a feeling of an image to you. And so the first one is this explosion in population. The other one is that there's like been a flip in the abundance. And so um, originally in 1850, we're in the throes of the gold rush. Um, there are very, very few women in California. Only 7,000 women were counted in 1850. Um, and that continues for a while that there's, that there's more males and females, but then that flips. And then in 1970, we have many more females than males um, you know, maybe this is a result of, um, you know, of uh, uh, decades of war. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But by 2010, things seem to be balancing out again, where they're, they're, by 2010, uh, U.S. Census, they seem to be more imbalanced than ever before. Okay, so those are two things from the population chart. Um, I think I'll, I'll pause there. Any, any comments on, um, on California before we go to COVID viz? I think no. it's awesome. Oh, somebody okay. joining in? Yeah, I found the, uh, 
I don't the agricultural one absolutely fascinating that 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 there is billions and billions of dollars pulled in. I knew agriculture was one of our biggest, but it it doesn't until you see it and then how much land space like that is just how many billions and how much of our land space is used on that. It's much simpler to sort of get a grasp on on where our money and how we're using our land is. Yes, and 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 and, and these are just the top six crops. Um, there's of course dozens and dozens of crops, and it, within those dozens and dozens of crops, I learned that many crops. California is the sole producer for the United States, um, meaning that they produce over 99% of that crop um, inside the United States. So um, uh, y y the importance of the Central Valley, you know, the big water projects, uh, you know, can't can't you know, can't be understated and is a, um, a, a critical part, I think, of, uh, of being a Californian is understanding this contribution that we make, um, you know, and, and, and this, this really, um, you know, sort of great gift that we give, you know, to, to the whole country. Yeah. I've got to say strawberries are blowing my mind right now because it's such like little land compared to how much uh, market value it gets. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a, that, that, that's a great, great shocker. And you think of a strawberry plant and it kind of makes sense, right? Like it, like there's a lot of fruit on that, on that plant and then look at almonds, right? So almonds like are eating up all this land. If you know anything about almonds, you know that they're very, very water intensive. Um, you know, you might've seen graphics of like, you know, the gallons and gallons and gallons of water it takes to produce, you know, a handful of almonds. Um, and so they're incredibly resource intensive, but also, um, you know, very valuable. Okay, so let's uh, let's go let's go on to you know a topic that you know is is very exciting, but you know a little also like a little bit you know obviously more serious um, than some of this stuff, which is COVID nineteen viz. And so I, I I'm currently not producing any COVID nineteen viz uh, in public, but I am involved uh, during my day job. Um, uh, uh, working on some COVID-19 uh, vis for, for, for government. Um, so these aren't, this is not my work. It's, it's um, you know, it's mostly work of journalists, um, which, and, and maybe you've seen some of these charts. And so the first one I'll start with is this is the print New York Times from this morning. Okay, so the New York Times um, on the front page, you know, in no small way is featuring a data visualization map. And so what you have is um, is this is this form where you have um, history all the way at the bottom? That's the past, and then we get closer and closer to today as you go up. And so they're arranging. They have this timeline from bottom to top, and then each timeline you can see um, uh, growing number of deaths. And so here's a um, here's a closer view on 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 a recent version of this graphic. And you can see that horrible, horrible spike in New York City compared to compared to the rest of the country. And you know, the, the big question looking at a graph like uh, looking at a chart like this is, well, is 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 New York an outlier? You know, is it strange or is it a canary? You know, is New York telling the rest of the country that this is what's coming to you? Right. And that's sort of what um, what everybody's um, you know concerned with. And so I think that we can understand, you know. How, how well this chart works by looking at another recent New York Times publication that's in the same family of graphics. And so um, this spike chart is showing total deaths. This is total confirmed cases, okay? And instead of using the spikes, they're using these bubbles. And these bubbles, these circles are sized. The, the bigger the circle, the more cases there are. They're, um, they're located over the different jurisdictions. Um, and and I, I believe they're, they're, uh, they're mapping them by county. And so the really big problem with this approach is that New York is such an outlier right now. It's so big and the tri-state area is, 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 has so many cases that it just looks like this big jumbled mess, right? Like all you can see by looking at that is that, okay, there's a lot of activity there. And if you look at the social media version of these two charts and compare them side by side, so this is a little bit blurry because they're, they're pulled from Twitter, um, but like, like how, how, how helpful is the, tr is the map on the left with, with all of these 
uh, with all these overlapping bubbles. Now, the, the, now again, on the left, we have uh, detected cases. On the right, we have total deaths. So it's not mapping the same data, but, but that's okay. We can still compare, p- compare the forms and, and see how the overlap of all these circles is just starting to, you know, what it tells you is like, oh, there's a lot there, but it really doesn't help you discriminate or see anything uh, in particular. Whereas the spikes on the right, I think are really, really quite effective. Okay, so we're sort of starting with COVID-19. It's interesting to see kind of where outbreaks are at the beginning, but eventually with COVID-19, it's everywhere. And so all of these sorts of approaches become less and less useful as we get deeper and deeper into the pandemic. And Randall Monroe and XKCD, um, you know, sort of described this and pet peeve number 208, geographic profile maps, which are basically just population maps. And so all these COVID-19 maps are basically slowly just becoming population maps. And when it just becomes a population map, it just doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, it, it, it's not meaningful. It's not interesting anymore. Okay, so um, I want to return back to that front page graphic and, and show a particular, you know, a particular design flourish that I think really helps make um, this map come alive. And so again, not the best quality graphic um, or quality image, but what you can see is that top spike, they've, they've chosen a scale that allows that top spike to pierce the masthead. And I mean, uh, the New York Times is not the first to do this. Um, others did it. I think Washington Post and Wall Street Journal both did it um, a couple of weeks ago. But every time you see you know, the decision to allow a graphic to invade that sacred space, um, you know, they are really calling your attention to how strange this is. Um, you know, I, I, I can only imagine, you know, the, the, the discussion, you know, that, that allows this type of invasion to happen. And I said, you know, other publications have done similar things to try to convey how, how severe this pandemic um, is. And so again, you're, you're conveying uh, the severity you know, through salience, but it's not just the salience of the spike, which is a very sharp, scary object, but it's the salience of the color, blood red, um, which attracts attention, but it's also the salience of breaking norms, the salience of, of, of invading that masthead. And, you know, there is a, you know, there, again, this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, the historic reference for this is the, um, the Society of Calligraphers, where they have this really um, you know, sort of uh, comic chart, a chart showing the percentage of excellence in the and and the um, and the prop uh, and the physical properties of book publishers since 1910. And what's interesting is that the New York Times, going back to it, you know, it's very obvious that this was produced by a computer, that this was not illustrated, you know, really by hand, that this is something that's sort of created by a machine, um, you know, with very strict rules. Whereas this. Um, this example, it's about a hundred years old. Um, you know, it's so obvious that this has a human touch and the way that they, they break the grid lines and they break the frame. Um, and, and then they, they jumble all the text and even in some cases smash the letters. And, you know, this is an example of, of, I I believe something that just really soars in, in, in in an incredibly human and engaging and delightful way. Okay, so that's New York Times. Uh, any questions on New York Times um, COVID maps before we go on? There's a lot of good conversation in the chat, but I, I think you're okay to keep going unless somebody shouts out right now. Okay, okay. So um, the other one I want you know, there, you know, the first real graphic meme of COVID nineteen was the idea of flattening the curve, and so this is um, uh, UW has IHME, which has um, these um, really great projections state by state and also at a national level. And so here I've, I've signaled out um, a critical resource, which is ICU beds. And you can see that California, um, we can see its, its projected um, peak five days until peak resource use, which is April 13th. Um, and we can see that where we are um, today and sort of a projection um, where, with that shading. It's like, well, we might, we might need this many, you know, um, we expect um, that many by the dashed line, or, or it, it's possible that we'll be really lucky and that we'll only need a few. And then you can see the capacity at 2,000 beds at the very top green line. And how, you know, even in, in, in a 95, um, 
uh, I think it's a 95th percentile case, we're, we're not going to get anywhere near that peak resource. And so understanding this projection, seeing charts like this can help California leadership decide, you know what, we don't need certain resources such as ventilators. We're going to put those on an airplane and send them to a state that is, is, is really desperate. So who's really desperate? So let's look at New York. So it's the same chart for New York. And you can see where they are today and you can see the expected demand and you can see that green horizontal line, which is what their capacity is. And you can see that they've already broken through their capacity and you know are expected to to keep to to keep going and so they're you know they're over six seven eight times what their capacity is and so um you know thinking back to that that um that zion versus yosemite you know making a comparison between two different things you know within this chart you can make a comparison you know where are we now versus our capacity um where are we today versus where we expect to be tomorrow or a week from now? But then you can also look at two states and make comparisons, meaningful comparisons, really useful comparisons that you can decide to take action on between the two states. Um, okay, so I, I really like these IHME. Uh, Another one is the Texas Tribune just launched, um, you know, again, sort of more of a public facing informative, and it's basically showing Texas, um, you know, these are decisions you can do. You can, you can do nothing, which is what a lot of Texas um, cities are doing. You can close the schools or you can, you can um, do the, uh, physical distancing, reduce contact, you know, and, and depending on how much you do that, you can really flatten the curve. Um, and so you can see hospital capacity, um, you know, again, as that horizontal dashed line um, and, then, and then these, these colors. And I think that there's, you know, something really attractive about this. I mean, there's a lot of flatten the curve charts out there and um, their, their particular color choices here, I think makes it really, really, um, you know, just engaging and attractive. I really like that. And then I'm going to, um, the last COVID chart I'm going to show is one by John Byrne Murdoch. John Byrne Murdoch is the breakout star of COVID uh, graphics. And so he publishes um, several charts every single day um, on Twitter. Um, you know, if you want to get really into you know, COVID visualization, this is a great place to start. So what are we looking at? We're looking at daily deaths with coronavirus um, by number of days since three daily deaths first recorded. And so I, I think it might be useful to just spend a little time with this chart because what's interesting about this chart is that it is, it is not particularly conventional. Um, there's a lot of unique um, um, things that John is doing in his presentation of this data um, that you normally wouldn't put in front of a general general audience. So the first thing is, we've, if we look at the, the timeline on the bottom, number of days since three daily deaths first recorded. And so what he's doing is he's syncing all of these different areas to the same timeline because people get infected, uh, areas get infected at different times. The virus is spreading. And so he's saying, well, let's all like sync all of these areas on the same timeline, because then if we compare their patterns, maybe we can, maybe we can learn something. So that, that's the X axis. And the Y axis is even more unfamiliar to a general audience, because what he's doing is he's not plotting the numbers. What he's doing is he's plotting the logarithm of the numbers. And logarithm is a word that um, shuts people down even more than the word data does. But really what all a logarithm is, is it plots ratios. And so Remember, like the big goal is how do you take something that's invisible and bring it into physical space so that we can actually all see it and have a discussion about it. And so if you noticed, so what's a ratio? A ratio is one number compared to a number, uh, to another, right? And so what he's really doing, he's not plotting the numbers, he's plotting the ratios of the numbers. And so if you, if you spend a little time with the y-axis, what you'll notice is that the distance, again, the physical space, which is what we're so concerned with, the distance between five and 10, a doubling, is the same as the distance between 10 and 20. Like, so two times 10 is 20. And that space, that ratio is given the same amount of real estate as five to 10. Now look at the very top of the chart, 1,000 to 2,000, also a doubling. It's the doubling that he's plotting. And so the logarithm, again, a fancy word, all that it's doing is it's giving equal space to the same ratio. In this case, he's, he's annotating, he's labeling the doubling ratio. So you can see that five to 10, 10 to 20, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000. All of these doublings get the same amount of space. 
And the reason why that's useful right now is that if you didn't do it like that, all of these, all of these charts would be very, very hard to discriminate. You wouldn't really be able to learn a lot by comparing them. Um, okay, so that's like just a, a general introduction to sort of the interesting choices he's making on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and and then we can actually look at the chart a little bit, and we can see California, which is a medium blue line, sort of in the middle of the chart compared to New York State, and we can see how lucky we've been so far as Californians to avoid the fate that's befallen uh, New York State as New York State rises and um, continues to experience. Uh, more daily deaths um, every single day. Um, okay, so that's, um, I think that's all the examples of COVID viz that I have uh, selected for you today. But I think that maybe we should pause and, you know, um, I see like quite a lot of, uh, of messages firing up. So Nick, can you, can you maybe, um, you know, sort of uh, d direct whatever discussion we want to have around these? Yeah, yeah. Um... Sorry, are you gonna keep the screen on? Just, yeah, you can. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll keep it on for a little sense. bit. I've been sharing, at least on Monday, I don't know if I did it last week too, the, the, I forget which one, but the, the one that you can look at the different states. I've shared that and I'll confess, I look at that like three times a day and I look at all the states that I've lived in or I'm thinking mm -hmm. about or, I mean, it was really interesting. I wish it had a history because the California projections like, four days ago were dramatically different than like somewhere yes. between checking it on Saturday night and Sunday night. It, yeah. it, it was a remarkably different chart, yes. um, which was very encouraging as I go and look at Michigan where my family is or New York where friends and uh, it's, it's horrifying. Um, yes. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it'd be, it would be interesting to see the a chart of the projections as well. Yeah. How the, well, yeah. And, and the, the, the nature of, of this communicable disease is that, you know, early on, um, you know, it's, it's almost a chaotic system where early on, it's hard to know where it's going to go. And so every single day that you get, you know, more information, you can get a little bit more confidence about where it's going to go because it's very easy for something to go wildly out of control. And, you know, we're talking a lot about space and we're talking about time. And so when we think about the, the data behind, uh, behind a, a, a pandemic, you have to realize that there's a, uh, there's a relationship between how, how, how much information the data can tell you and, and when it can tell you something about. And so, um, you know, deaths, you know, that's very, very solid information. Like you, you're, you are dead or you are not dead. Right. And, and we have, pretty, you know, we have not great data on deaths, but pretty good data on deaths. And I say not great because a lot of people are dying from COVID. We think, you know, that are outside of the system, you know, that aren't, you know, they weren't tested. And so maybe they're not being logged as COVID deaths. That said, like, you know, whether you're dead or not, like it's, it's a pretty black and white matter. Um, but the problem is that somebody who, who dies today from COVID-19 was infected maybe a month ago, maybe five weeks ago. And so there's a very long lag between having that high quality data, the death data, and understanding where we are on the timeline. Now, what's, what's something that sort of, that shrinks that lag? Well, infected, you know, are you infected or not? Um, you know, if we know that you're infected, well, you're probably infected two, three weeks ago. And, but the problem is, well, the, the quality is, is of that infect, infection data is a little, a little le bit less black and white because we're not, we're not testing everybody. And, you know, infamously in America, we tested very, very few people at, 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 at the outset. And so there's this inverse relationship between what the data can tell you and, and, and when they can tell you about. Yeah. And I'm glad you, you know, I've been seeing this chart by John Byrne Murdoch uh, or various versions of it. Um, but mm. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't slowed down to figure out how to read it. I mean, you can kind of feel what's going on without it, but it's really helpful to, to have you yeah. walk us through it. And, and, and that feel is important. That feel is actually the intention of the chart. And, you know, uh, more technically, you know, when we say feel, what the, the goal of this chart is not to read a particular number because the number is not right. The, like we don't really know exactly what's happening. The data isn't just good enough quality yet. 
Um, it, it may never be, but we can get a sense from the data. And, and so what we're really trying to do is compare the patterns. It's like, that's what's most interesting. And what this logarithmic plot does is it gives you an opportunity to compare patterns and get a sense of what's happening by comparing the different patterns. Yeah. I mean, I think I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to push this, this stuff that we're, I was going to do it anyway, but push it earlier in our, in our term is one, we're confronted with so much of this and, and people so clearly don't know how to read it or misuse it or, you know, just don't get it. But once, once you can see it and you see the power of it, I, I think it's really sort of empowering. Um, mm. And I think, you know, you're clearly demonstrating. I think that's a tool you're giving, you're giving everybody that's listening right now. Um, Mm. Yes. Yeah. And, I mean, I, mean I, good. I, I, I don't understand everything. Um, the audience doesn't understand everything. There's a huge spectrum, you know, of, of what people are able to engage in and take away from. But what is true is that over time, especially over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, there's been an enormous surge in the democratization of this craft, meaning that many more people are able to engage in it and, and produce data stories, charts, data visualizations, information graphics, um, and, and the audience data literacy, their ability to look at a chart like this and get something out of it, their willingness to engage and think that this is something that's worth their, their, their precious um, time, that's also increased. And so there, there's sort of a, there is sort of a surging um, you know, uh, tide that is really lifting um, all boats, no matter, no matter what kind of boat it is. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's just so important and you see people, I mean, I won't name their names, but I mean, you see people saying, oh, well, it's not as bad as it is. So we should just go back to doing what we're doing, which is like this very intentional misreading of, of these charts. You know I mean? Mm. So I think the more people are educated on uh, how to read them and why they work and it can really like prevent going the wrong direction <laughs> can prevent yeah, flattening. I, 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 yeah. Um, I think that there is um, an aspect again of trying to pull the invisibilia into the world of visibilia and you know, what's most invisible, the future, you know, projections, predictions, what's going to happen? What is tomorrow going to look like? Um, you know, it's very, very hard to develop any kinds of, um, consensus, especially of course, when there's, there's other, you know, underlying motivating, you know, uh, economic political forces involved. Um, but I, I, I do believe it's possible to have a, a not only a clearer view of the future, but a, a clearer shared view of the future. Nice. So Carmen, Carmen's got, an, and others have a question about organizing data. Uh, Carmen, why don't you unmute and ask it yourself? Uh, I wrote in the chat, how do you organize your data? Because I have trouble figuring out how to track and also just try to make sure that everything is neat. <laughs> yeah. So this is sometimes called um, data wrangling or data munging. And um, my experience is that it's always, it's always uh, hor horrible. <laughs> and um, it's it's never it's it's never been easy for me. Um, I mean, quite honestly, I spent the weekend data wrangling and trying to format data in a way that I could get it uh, clean enough to visualize. And it's um, it can sometimes be fun because there is a sense of you're you're bringing order to chaos. Um, but but um, to do it, you know, day after day after day can be really taxing. And so from a creative perspective, what I always make sure is that there's some sort of buffer between doing that, that taxing data wrangling work and doing the visualization. Because the first time you encounter data that's ready to be visualized is a special opportunity um, you know, to, to, to see it with fresh eyes. Um, and, and you only really get that opportunity once. You want to make sure you're, that you are as energetic and ready as possible. So I always try to sort of get my data ready you know, and then go off, work on something else, take a nap, you know, sleep on it kind of, kind of, and then, and then you, you, you come and you have a clean data set to visualize. Now, maybe you don't always have that, that luxury, but, um, but, but th that's, that's the intention. 
because okay. um, for our class, we have this data set. What I've been doing is I put everyone's numbers on like a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that's helping me <laughs> at the moment, but yeah, for some reason, well, I feel like that kind of helps me like read things better. So sure. that I can figure yeah. out how to visualize it that way. Yeah, I mean, a, a spreadsheet is a great a great way to start um, organizing it. Uh, absolutely. You know, and a reference for, you know, how to, and then there's a reference for like, what's the best way to organize your spreadsheet? And you might want to look up um, a method called tidy data, T-I-D-Y, tidy data. Um, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a Wikipedia article. And I, I mean, there's like lots of technical, you know, sort of, uh, you know, documentation, but the big idea is that you like each, you, you got to figure out what you're measuring, you know, what's your unit of analysis. Um, you know, if you're looking at, I think you mentioned earlier, like, some sort of activity that you observe, um, you know, well then, then like that's a unit of analysis. Like each thing that you're recording is, a, is, is an observation of activity. And the idea with tidy data is that then each, each unit would get its own row. And so each unit has its own row and, you know, that means that you, if you have a lot of observations, the rows get very, very, you know, you could have many, many rows and that's fine. Um, and then what you ha do with the columns in your spreadsheet is you're able to put sort of attributes of that observation. You know, where was it? What time of day was it? Notes on the, you know, notes on the observation. Um, and so you have all your different sort of data fields built off of each observation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Good. I think a, a big part for Carmen and, and, and all of us is like, if you haven't done it, it's hard to do. I mean, if you've mm -hmm. never, I mean, it's, it's, it's making comics, making anything until you've like messed around and messed around and made mistakes. And so, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, partly we, we've got a couple sample sets that we're going to do that, that we want to just sort of get our feet wet in and, and play with it. You're, you've obviously got slightly more experience than us and it's still hard because you're mm -hmm. trying to make it professional and, um mm -hmm. you know i mean i think in our case it's like we make i think you said it really well that it's one sort of looking at the data and then it's the drawing of the data and i assume that there's a lot of back and forth between like mm -hmm. you know notice trying to figure out ways to organize it to see patterns and then trying to draw it in ways that helps you but then that makes you go back to your data again i assume and, and look at it in a new way yes so um so it, it is hard and the best way to learn it is by doing it, you know, hopefully with, you know, small projects and then, you know, your, your, your projects sort of increase in scale and complexity. And there is an iterative nature to this craft where you dive into the chaos, into data. Um, you come out of it with some sort of um, visual form and that visual form teaches you something about the chaos. And it, it gives you an idea of how to tweak the visual form or how to, how to figure out how to make a new visual form that will teach you even more. And so when we, we talked about that cathedral story, you know, a lot of those diagrams was me diving in and thinking, oh, now I wanna see it this way. And you know, sometimes when you wanna see it in a particular way to understand it better, you don't have the data to do that. And you actually have to go and get that data. Um, you have to go and make that data. Um, and, and then you, know, you have that data, you're able to see it that new way you have some learning and you know, there's dead ends everywhere and you have to retreat and figure out a new way of seeing it. But it's, it, it, it is a, a, an, an iterative uh, learning uh, cycle. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, I mean, we've, we've been looking at examples and we have examples from you. We have examples from Dear Data, which is a different sort of thing altogether, but, but certainly some of those skills transfer um and a lot of the the different different things we've looked at that we can sort of steal from and like say well what if i did it like that and then why isn't that working um mm -hmm. yeah somebody else want to get a last word in you talked about making like in the past uh past few years uh you know making this these more accessible getting you know uh getting a little bit more credibility for it uh, what is being done in that respect? What allows what allows for that? If that question makes sense, what do you think people are looking at? Uh, yeah, so there's a there's a surge in digital data, uh, an, an enormous surge in digital data, um, and you know there's there's sort of tensions and interesting 
results from having so much digital data, but we have a lot of digital data. It's very viable. And so what does that mean? It means that uh, on top of that surge of data, we have an explosion in tools and we have an explosion. So we, we have all kinds of um, software and libraries, but then we also have a, an explosion, honestly, in attention. And so all kinds of people who would normally be doing something else are now doing this. Um, and so there's an explosion in the number of people who are able to, uh, who are able to, to do this work. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, I was thinking about thermometers when you said that, you know, these digital thermometers that they're now mm -hmm. using that are all networked together to see that, well, fevers are going up in this city and, and not on the rise in that city. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of crazy thing that we now know about areas. Yes. And now they're, you know, maybe that those are going to become ubiquitous with whatever privacy concerns that now raises too. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, that's something that didn't exist one year ago, even. I, I don't know. I've never, I never heard of it until a month ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we might, I might be time to just say, RJ, that was awesome. Uh, maybe you guys can unmute. And I mean, it was really, you know, I've heard you a couple of times. I've read you, I've known you and mm -hmm. I'm always like learning a lot more and I'm just geeked about it. I think it's super helpful to us and, and more people need to hear it. Um, cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's been so a real joy. You, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. So if you guys want to unmute for a second and um, I'll just, yeah, to all of you, I'll send you a note on what we got to do and stuff like that. But, um, but let's give RJ a, a big thank you and, and um, have a good week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Everybody be well and stay healthy and um, see you next week. But I'll, I'll check in with the rest of you. RJ, keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Get, back, right. get, get back to it. Yeah, get Thank back you. to it. Thanks for being awesome. <laughs>